I would like to welcome you personally to tonight's webinar entitled SBIRT, a model for assessing and treating alcohol misuse in primary care. It is presented by Mr. Aaron Williams, who's the Director of Training and Technical Assistance for Substance Abuse. Mr. Williams leads the National Council Center for Integrated Health Solutions, Strategic Initiatives on Substance Use Screening and Treatment. He also provides direct training and technical assistance services that promote primary and behavior health care integration with special attention to addiction treatment providers. He's written and contributed to, contributed to numerous articles and reports on drugs of abuse, workforce development of substance abuse professionals, and implementation of evidence-based practices. He holds a bachelor's degree in psychology from Morehouse College and a master's degree in psychology from the Catholic University. Tonight's um, webinar is approved for one hour of CME credit with the American Academy of Family Physicians. Questions and or comments can be submitted to the presenter throughout the presentation. However, he probably will not answer them until the very end, but please feel free to submit them as they come up and we'll hold them to that time. So with that said, ladies and gentlemen, please welcome me in joining Mr. Aaron Williams. Hello, everyone, and, and thank you for inviting me, uh, Sabrina. Um, as Sabrina said, my name is Aaron Williams, and I'm the Director of Training and Technical Assistance for the National Council for Community Behavioral Health Care's Center for Integrated Health Solutions. The Center for Integrated Health Solutions is funded by SAMHSA and HRSA to promote the development of integrated and primary um, behavioral health primary care um, in, in, all, in behavioral health settings. So a part of our efforts deal with a public health initiative called ESPER, Screening, Brief Intervention, and Referral to Treatment. So tonight, what I want to do is go over some of the components of ESPER, and then at the end, we can answer any questions you may have related to ESPER and, and its use. So um, just to start, um, this is my disclosure statement. Um, do not have any financial or other relationships with the manufacturer of any commercial services um, discussed in this activity. So the agenda for tonight is first I want to go over you know what exactly is ESPERT, um, why screening for alcohol use is important, the benefits of ESPERT, and then I'll talk about um, just as a correction to that slide I'll talk about the components of ESPERT and then some discussion of barriers and other considerations and at the end we'll talk about some resources uh, as we as you move forward in, in implementing your expert um, project um, some resources for you going forward so what is expert screening brief intervention and referral to treatment is a comprehensive public health approach to delivery of <clears throat> to the delivery and uh, to delivery of care and early intervention for folks who may be at risk for, um, for substance use or at risk drinking um, ESPER can be delivered in a number of different primary care settings, including trauma settings, settings emergency departments, and other settings um, that involve uh, primary care, um, STD clinics, other settings, health centers, uh, fellow qualified health centers, other places where, um, where primary care services are being rendered, and it is a public health approach to screening and intervening early in risky alcohol use for the benefit of everyone. So what are the goals of ESPER? Well, um, there are three major goals of ESPER. Um, the first is to encourage healthcare providers to screen and provide advice or counseling to their patients who misuse alcohol or drugs. The second is to influence risky behavior patterns and reduce exposure to negative consequences of misuse. And finally, and maybe most importantly, um, is to improve the linkages between general community health care and specialized substance abuse treatment providers to help facilitate uh, patients getting the level of care that they need relative to um, their alcohol use or abuse. So why should you screen for alcohol? Well there are a number of reasons and when you uh, check the data and you look at some of the statistics you get a number of different things that pop out at you. Um, one is the most common contributory factor to injury occurrence is alcohol abuse. 
Um, alcohol is responsible for half of all trauma deaths and non-fatal injuries in the United States. Um, other statistics indicate that uh, between 15 and 25 percent of, of injury of pa patients who are injured and come into emergency rooms, um, they test positive for alcohol in their um, blood system. And so you, you have a number of different reasons why alcohol, while screening for alcohol is particularly important in primary care settings. So what are some of the effects of alcohol? Um, the alcohol has a number of, well, risky alcohol use has a number of different effects on the, um, on the body. Um, this chart here indicates just a few of the effects that alcohol has, um, in al heavy alcohol use has, such as certain types of cancers, stomach problems, reduced immunity, liver disease, diabetes. Um, it can also contribute to aggression depression, and also exacerbate social, family, legal, and financial problems. This slide discusses um, the number of medications, just a few of the medications in which the use of, alcohol, of excessive alcohol is contraindicated because the alcohol interferes with the effectiveness of the drugs. Um, as you can see, the list covers all sorts of medications for all sorts of ailments, antibiotics, antidepressants, antihistamines, barbiturates, benzodiazepines, muscle relaxants, uh, non-opioid pain medications. So excessive use of alcohol <coughs> um, not only uh, makes some, some um, illnesses worse, but it also interferes with medications that are designed to treat those specific illnesses. Um, in a report just last year issued by the uh, Office of National Drug Control Policy, um, they estimated that the cost of uh, substance use in this country, the estimated societal cost of substance use in this country is about $193 billion. A lot of that cost is driven by excessive or harmful alcohol use. And in this slide is another um, from an earlier data set where they talk about um, um, problems with risky or problem uh, drinkers. Um, you know, even though on average the problems of, of individual uh, risky uh, drinkers are less severe than the problems of harmful drinkers or dependent drinkers, there are far more risky drinkers um, in the larger population and they have considerable costs to the society in terms of loss of productivity, um, financial considerations, uh, social concerns, uh, DUIs, um, medical related problems, emergency room visits for injuries. Um, so there is you know, plenty of evidence out there as to why you should screen and intervene early in order to uh, address problems with risky drinking. What you see on this slide is what's called the drinker's pyramid. Um, this is a slide which sort of breaks up the general population and looks at um, the prevalence of certain levels of alcohol use uh, within the general population. Um, as you can see, the majority of the population is in this sort of abstainer to low risk category. But then you have a number of folks who are in the um, category of high risk drinkers and folks who are either alcohol dependent or probable, al probable alcohol dependent, have probable alcohol dependence. Uh, screening and brief intervention is looking at really those top two categories, um, high risk drinkers and those that are probable alcohol dependent um, drinkers in order to intervene uh, in those, uh, <coughs> uh, with those uh, clients and get them help as soon as possible. So um, this slide is, is a discussion about the um, difference between abuse and dependence. Um, these are the, the criteria from the DSM, with the current version of the DSM, around abuse versus dependence. Um, as you can see, um, abuse and dependence are very similar with the exception of dependence having the additional two criteria of withdrawal and tolerance. Um, it is important to note that in order for the diagnosis to be made, patients must experience these symptoms for at least one year. So, so this just gives you a sense of what the criteria is when we discuss uh, alcohol abuse versus alcohol dependence. So what are the benefits of using the expert model? 
Well, and when you go back to the data and go back to statistics, um, the st statistics um, related to this, you see there are a number of different positive outcomes as it relates to screening and intervention. Um, brief interventions may reduce mortality rates for problem drinkers by anywhere from 23 to 26 percent. Um, compared to a control, an intervention group has significantly fewer accidents, hospital visits, and other events related to drinking. Um, this data is taken from a study uh, done in Texas which uh, surveyed more than 8,500 patients and what they found was that 71 percent of drinkers reduced the number of days they drank alcohol after having received uh, screening and brief intervention. 85 percent of binge drinkers reduced the number of heavy drinking days. Um, 68 percent of those reported no heavy drinking days in the past 30 days. Um, 76 percent of the patients assessed as needing more specialized services saw an improvement in their general health after receiving a screening and brief intervention. So the use of SBIRT is not just important in terms of um, intervening and reducing the amount of alcohol and problems related to alcohol um, by the patient. It's also integral in helping the patient achieve a higher level of, of health as it relates to any other health problems or health concerns they may have. So if you look at um, some other data um, related to the outcomes for the use of SBI, you also see uh, a cost benefit. Um, in trauma center analysis, for every dollar spent on screening and brief intervention, there was a $3.81 um, direct injury related cost <coughs> savings. In, community, um, in a community clinic analysis of 800 heavy drinkers, patients that received an intervention had significantly fewer accidents, hospital visits, adver adverse events related to drinking, and it generated nearly $56,000 in savings for every 10000 invested. So clearly there is a cost benefit to the general health care field around doing this type of screening. Some of the other benefits of, of SBIRT. Um, it doesn't require any sort of alcohol or drug specialist to do the screening and brief intervention. Um, it um, it <clears throat> really allows folks to um, look at drug and alcohol use on a continuum versus the concept of either addicted or not. Um, you can look at it on a continuum, which means that the expert process itself allows you to tailor um, your activities and actions in order to meet the needs of the client. Um, provides an active and systematic way to screen and provide a brief intervention and referral to more services. Um, it, it helps in terms of providing an approach in terms of language of how do you talk to your clients uh, as you as you go forward with their medical care and you realize that they may be using drugs or alcohol, it gives you some framework in order to talk to them and provide information to them about um, you know, better choices as it relates to alcohol use. So, what are the components of ESPER? Well, first one's sort of obvious, uh, screening. And screening is a quick, simple method of identifying patients who use substances at at-risk or hazardous levels, as well as those who may already have substance use-related disorders. Um, the screening instruments provide uh, feed, direct feedback to the patient as it relates to their substance use. So uh, once they fill out the form or once you administer the screening tool, you're able to provide the excuse me, um, provide the, uh, the client or patient with direct feedback on the spot about you know, where they are in terms of their level of drinking. Um, it's certainly beneficial to use a tool that has been reliable, um, that, has been, that, is, uh, that is valid or reliable. There's certainly a number of tools out there that are, that you can use, so you don't have to really reinvent the wheel as it relates to uh, doing screenings, and we'll talk about um, a few of the main tools um, in a few. So in terms of, like I said, there are multiple options, various tools being administered, so let's talk about those here. Um, some of the main tools that are used in order to uh, assess or, or screen for 
uh, alcohol use in primary care settings are um, sort of the larger one, which is um, the, the easier one, which is the blood alcohol content. So when folks come into emergency rooms or trauma centers, um, folks take screen, you know, look at blood levels and take screens to see how much alcohol is in the blood. Um, for purposes of this discussion, we're probably going to focus more on the um, um, written or computerized self-administered tests rather than the uh, actual medical tests um, involving blood alcohol content. Um, you have one of the main ones recommended by NIAAA, which is the audit, the alcohol use disorders identification test, um, which incorporates questions about quantity and frequency of alcohol use. You have the CAGE, which is a four per, which is a four question screen, which fits in very nicely as it relates to uh, <clears throat> um, delivering it in a uh, primary care setting. There, there are four main questions um, ab about you know uh, related to have you ever had folks uh, anyone criticize you for your drinking? Um, have you ever felt that you should quit drinking? Um, have you ever taken a drink uh, in the morning just to take the edge off? So there are four really uh, short questions which a lot of primary care folks like because they don't have to um, have something written down. They can pretty easily remember the questions and they can incorporate those into their workflow. Um, the ASSIST, which is the Alcohol, Smoking, and Substance Involvement Screening Test, and that test is developed by the World Health Organization, and it screens, it's a more comprehensive screen around alcohol, tobacco, um, and other drugs of abuse. So, so it get, it's a more global screen which covers more than just alcohol use. The uh, DAST, which is the uh, Drug Abuse Screening Test, and that one has a, it's a much longer screen, it's a self-administered tool and is used to detect drug problems and also assist in terms of staging the patient um, in terms of level of possible dependence. So it's a more comprehensive test and um, you know when you take that test it gives you a much better indication of where folks are as it relates to um, dependence if they have moved into that category. It's a very good test for assessing that. You have the craft, which is um, a, a tool that's really specifically designed to um, assess drinking and harmful or risky drinking levels in uh, children and adolescents. And then you also have the tweak, and the tweak is more specifically designed to uh, assess lower levels of drinking, um, but specifically for pregnant women, um, because pregnant women, because use of alcohol in, in, in any amount for pregnant women is uh, contraindicated. So the tweak is designed to uh, assess that for them. So before we go any further, it's sort of important that when we begin this conversation about uh, screening, and in and, and the, the concepts of, of harmful or risky drinking, that we actually have some sort of uh, firm understanding of what we're talking about when we discuss the concept of, of drinking. So what is a standard drink? Um, and there are a number of different uh, you know, measures of this. The um, NIAAA has uh, codified, essentially, uh, what a, a standard drink looks like. And this uh, chart is taken directly from NIAAA and it gives you an idea of, with each category of uh, alcohol, what a standard drink is. So you see a standard drink in terms of a beer um, is different from a standard drink um, of a spirit or a standard drink um, as it relates to wine. So when you have discussions with your clients, it's important to have some idea of what a standard drink is um, when they talk to you about their drinking. And also to educate the client, because there are lots of clients who believe, say, a 16-ounce beer, having just one of them is um, just sort of a standard drink. Well, based on the guidelines by NIAAA, you know, one 16-ounce beer is actually uh, more than a standard drink. So if you're doing a couple of those a day, um, you're moving into um, more risky territory. And the client or the, or the patient may be a little, un, maybe more unaware of that, may not be aware of that. So um, what constitutes risky drinking? Well, again, this is um, a chart that was taken from NIAAA that gives you some parameters around drinking and um, around drinking and what the indications are based on um, their research. So for women, uh, two drinks, uh, more than two drinks per occasion 
um, in this, um, on, on any given day of the week. Um, from, for people over 65, the same, more than two drinks on any occasion, um, any day of the week. For men in general, under age of 65, um, four or more drinks on any occasion or um, more than 14 drinks per week. Uh, so, <clears throat> uh, it's, so, so that gives you some example of what is considered risky drinking. Um, also, any um, use of alcohol you know, um, for women who are pregnant, um, for folks who are driving, um, there's certain medications in which the use of alcohol is, is, is really problematic, like the use of, um, of barbiturates or benzo benzodiazepines, um, you know, having certain other medical conditions like hepatitis or some liver disorders where, you, where, where any use of alcohol is really very risky and puts you in a, a high risk category. Um, So, what does the initial screen look like? Well, the initial screen for uh, alcohol use really involves one to three questions. And, and those questions are really, you know, you know, basically, do you drink? Um, and then how much do you drink? So to get an idea of how much the person's drinking um, relative to the um, discussion we just had about what is a standard drink and what the parameters are around a standard drink. Um, if a person screens positive on, on one or more of these instruments that provide you with these um, one to three question screens, then that person should take a longer screen, um, like the assist or the audit, uh, which gives gives you a more which gives you a clearer picture of what their uh, alcohol or substance use looks like. The screening and risk assessment instruments provide patients reported information about substance use that any healthcare professional can easily score. So these are instruments that, that aren't difficult to score. I mean, it's literally uh, adding up numbers and, uh, you know, there are categories in which each uh, number set correspond to, which tell you about the level of drinking, um, whether or not the person's in the at-risk or, or hazardous level of drinking. So these are some examples of uh, some of the initial screening questions. How often do you drink anything containing alcohol? How many drinks do you have in a typical day when you're drinking? How often do you have four or more drinks on one occasion? In the last year, have you ever used drugs or, or <clears throat> um, excuse me, or, or anything else uh, or any any drugs for anything other than medical reasons? I mean, last year, have you used prescription or other drugs more than you meant to? What drugs do you um, use most frequently? Those are some of the questions related to uh, screening for uh, substances as well as alcohol. So when you're performing the screen, I mean, you want to engage in a few basic steps. Um, one is you want to introduce the screen. So you want to be very upfront and forthright with the client, with the patient. And let them know that you know you're screening for this, and you want to ask them a couple of questions related to their alcohol use, and you can tell them, um, you know, just just tell them very frankly that this is important part of your health care. That we don't want to provide you with medications in which you know um, if you're drinking large quantities of alcohol, they may interfere or not be as effective. So we need to ask these questions in order to support your overall health care. Um, you want to be specific in your questions. And make sure you're speaking the same language as the, as the patient, which you know, goes back to the conversation earlier, which is about making sure that your understanding of a standard drink or your understanding of what they're drinking is, is the same as the client's. Um, and during that process, you want to uh, make sure that you convey a non-judgmental attitude throughout the screen, um, no matter what their answers are. Again, you're the uh, professional there and you're, you're there to help. So. Now, after you've done the screen, the next component of expert is the brief intervention. So the brief intervention is a time-limited, patient-centered strategy that focuses on changing a patient's behavior by increasing insight and awareness regarding substance use. Um, the brief interventions are designed to motivate the patient to change their behavior and prevent the progression of substance use. So it provides the patient with personalized feedback that, that shows concern for his or her use. Um, <clears throat> usually the brief intervention is a 5 to 10 minute discussion. Um, sometimes it's longer, maybe 20 to 30 minutes depending on the level of uh, alcohol use. Um, but it provides the patient with personalized feedback 
and it gives them information they need if they are considering or, or want to consider making a change in their use of substances. It also provides them with educational information because in a lot of instances um, this is the first time that some of the patients may have been may have had alcohol use discussed with them in any sort of formal way. So it is important to provide them with information about their use of alcohol, how much they're using, what category that puts them in. So during the intervention, um, you're giving, you're giving the, pa the patient is giving information about their uh, substance use or about their alcohol use. Um, they're advised in clear but respectful terms to decrease or, assist or abstain from alcohol use. Um, they're encouraged to set goals. I think that's important when you have these discussions with patients that you don't just provide them with information about their use, but you actually talk to them and engage in a conversation about, you know, hey, these are my concerns about your health. These are my concerns about your level of drinking. Do you have any concerns about this? Um, you know, do you have any goals in terms of cutting down? Would you like to set some? Um, you know, those sorts of things are the things that are covered as you move forward with um, a brief intervention. So, um, brief interventions, uh, one of the key points here, brief interventions are typically provided to patients with less severe alcohol or substance use problems. Um, these are folks who probably do not meet criteria for dependence and uh, who do not necessarily need a referral to additional treatment services. Um, the brief intervention um, can be done pretty much by most um, primary care professionals. So nurses, doctors, physician assistants, nurse practitioners, all can pretty much do the screening and brief intervention without much, without much problem. Um, some training is necessary, but you definitely um, can do that without um, you know, thousands of hours of training. So um, this slide um, talks about the um, De Clementi and Petraska's stages of change. Now the reason that this slide is in here is because, as I stated earlier, many of the uh, patients that you'll encounter as you um, screen for alcohol or screen for other substances and alcohol and other substances and you provide these brief interventions to will be people who have never been confronted or never had this sort of conversation about their drinking. So given that, there will be a different stages of change, or there will be a different stages in terms of wanting to change the alcohol use. Um, and you see sort of the stages there which go from denial, you know, all the way to action and maintenance. Um, th these are just you know, stages of change in which any of these clients may be in. So when you first bring these issues up, um, you may get a conversation about, oh, I don't have a problem. Or you may get some conversation about, um, you know, um, I may I have a problem, but it's not that severe. Or some people may be more proactive and they may say, oh, my, I have a problem. You know, let's move into some strategies around, uh, you know, uh, working, working through that problem. And others may come in. They already know they've had some conversation with folks about this and they already know and they are looking at trying to maintain plans that they already have in place to reduce their uh, alcohol use. So one of the hallmarks of uh, brief intervention is the use of skills from a therapeutic practice called motivational interviewing. And that's a client-centered, um, goal-directed counseling method to resolve ambivalence about health behavior change by building intrinsic motivation and strengthening commitment. Um, it's developed by Miller and Roenick and essentially you know, it, it builds off of De Clementi and Petraska's stages of change, and it is a <clears throat> therapeutic method which meets the client where they are and helps the client work through their own discrepancies and own ambivalence about the potential of either seeking help for their uh, alcohol problem or putting in plan, putting in place plans to reduce their alcohol use or make changes or adjustments in their life. Um, it assumes that sort of all change in people's life, um, you know, that before people make those changes, there is a, a point of ambivalence where, you know, people are doing sort of a cost-benefit analysis, weighing the positives of making the change versus the 
positives or, or, or negatives or staying the same. And it, it is designed to help clients sort of work through that. So, um, you know, using some motivational interviewing techniques within the brief intervention um, will be helpful in terms of helping move the patient through um, that process. So here are some examples of the kinds of things that you may ex encounter when you're providing that brief intervention. Uh, again, sort of denial statements of, look, I don't have a problem. Um, you know, other statements, my dad was an alcoholic and I'm not like that. Um, and here also to on the right side of the screen are some responses or some answers to that where you can you know, respond to that resistance in a way that's still respectful but helps to move the conversation forward in terms of addressing their substance use or, or alcohol use. Excuse me. Um, but you do want to keep in mind that when you're having these conversations with the patient you know, in the brief intervention, and the patients have options. Um, the, 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 it is the patient's responsibility to make changes or not make changes um, as they move forward. Uh, you can recommend, provide information, um, help to enhance motivation, but ultimately um, it is the, the patient's choice to make changes or not make changes as it relates to the alcohol use. Now, um, there's some patients who will come into your uh, <clears throat> excuse me. There's some patients who will come into your, your your health center, and they will screen positive or screen very high on the um, um, screenings, and they will need a more intensive intervention. So here's some of the components of that. Uh, the intensive inter intervention is usually for people who. Um, you know, come in who may have the disease of addiction or may be alcohol dependent, and so they certainly need a higher level and a longer length of intervention. So much of the discussion and in intensive intervention is similar to that of the brief intervention. However, the uh, sessions are much longer, 20 to 30 minutes, may include multiple sessions, so there may be times when you would need the person to come back in order to do um, more work around the intensive uh, intervention. And a lot of these programs um, are conducted by behavioral health specialists. Um, these clients typically are at higher levels of risk, may be alcohol dependent or drug dependent, and these interventions, these longer interventions, would potentially need um, someone with a little more training as it relates to behavioral health issues. So this is um, some of the criteria for um, you know, someone who may potentially need a, a more intensive intervention. Um, you having an audit score between 16 and 19. Um, a positive score in the DAST, which as we talked about earlier, is the more robust um, of the screening instruments related to alcohol use. Um, remission for one substance abuse uh, problem, but uh, you know, alcohol may be the second of, of, of a, of a sub second substance abuse problem they have if they you know, say they're in recovery from the use of cocaine, but they have high levels of drinking. I mean, that's a, a red flag. Um, they have, may have some medications that clearly interact with alcohol, uh, limited social supports, uh, the presence of co-occurring uh, um, medical, uh, serious medical problems or mental health disorders. Um, you know, they've had prior attempts at, at recovery and, and they failed. Um, uh, so they're waiting for treatment admission. Um, you know, wait, they, they tell you that they already have, you know, um, they realize that they have a problem and they're waiting on admission to treatment. Um, and or pregnant patients who have previous or current use of alcohol and, and, and report that they're continuing to use. Um, so, referral to treatment. So this is the final part of the expert process and in some ways one of the more important parts. So as you go through uh, and providing the screening and brief intervention, as we talked about earlier, most of the clients, that, uh, patients that you encounter will not need um, will not be uh, alcohol dependent. However, there are about two to five percent, that's what the data indicates, um, of your clients that will need uh, formal drug and alcohol treatment. So the referral process is about um, <clears throat> helping those patients actually access 
specialized treatment. Um, selecting treatment facilities, facilitating the navigation of any barriers uh, such as cost of treatment, lack of transportation that will hinder them from receiving uh, treatment in a specialty setting. So, so this um, referral treatment process is an extraordinarily important process because you are talking about folks that may be at risk uh, for, uh, that, that may be alcohol dependent and need a higher level of care than you may be able to provide at the primary care facility. And, you know, this, you know, having these encounters and walking through this process of getting them into uh, another level of treatment um, is, is one that you need to pay careful attention to because, you know, the, the patient may not understand all the things they need to do as it relates to going to a different level of care. Um, it's a different organization which has a different organizational culture. There may be sorts of fear about this. So you want to make sure that you're with the patient and help them work through that process. Uh, excuse me. So handling the referral process properly, ensuring that the patient receives the necessary care, coordination, and follow-up support services is critical to the treatment process and facilitating and maintaining recovery. Now, um, we want to spend a little bit of time before we get to resources and questions about some of the potential barriers and considerations as you attempt to implement a screening, brief, intervent brief intervention, and referral process at your um, primary care setting. One, which is a major one, um, is the sense of not having enough time to carry out the interventions. When people are typically presented with uh, the um, with the expert process, one of the main questions they ask is, "Well, you know, we have 15 other screens and other health care activities that we need to engage in in a short period of time with the client. How do we work this in? Um, asking these questions and moving this process forward." Um, that is certainly a, uh, a, 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 a definite consideration and also if you look at this slide it is um, a, a consideration that relates directly to the fourth one which is difficulty adding screening and brief intervention into the clinical workflow. Um, that's critical in terms of a primary care setting being able to incorporate these sorts of screening and this um, brief intervention into your overall workflow and your overall process. Um, you know, there are ways, as we talked about, in terms of the screens you ask, where you have some questions that easily flow into the general conversation that a medical professional would have with a patient. Um, so they aren't very intrusive at all. And the screening and brief intervention typically involve sort of a 15 minute time frame, which is consistent with um, what uh, primary care um, um, practitioners typically have to discuss, to talk with the patient. So there are definitely ways in which you can integrate this into your workflow in which you can do this in a reasonable amount of time. There are a number of resources um, you know, on the internet that have um, you know, large placards and, and, and specifically designed and, and um, you know, codified workflow processes which you can look at. Um, is, so that information is out there, but it is an important consideration. Um, another consideration of, of importance is payment and reimbursement. Um, and as we talked about, there are a number of different screen, number of different activities that primary care professionals uh, <clears throat> need to engage in in order to provide for the overall health of the patient. And doing something that you may or may not be reimbursed for um, would be prohibitive. Um, at this point, um, you know, thankfully, um, Espert is uh, paid for by Medicare and Medicaid. There are about, I think now, about 17 states that have the CPT codes that are turned on um, for that uh, in terms of paying for, for the screening and brief intervention. And there are a few uh, insurance companies that pay for screening and, and brief intervention as well. Um, another one of the uh, considerations of fear of, of losing or alienating patients, um, you know, dealing with this issue can be difficult for um, primary care uh, practitioners because this is a difficult subject to talk about. This is a uh, subject which 
you know, as, as we as we said, uh, you know, the the patient may not have had any discussions about this before, and you know, they don't want to risk alienating the patient and have the patient walk out or get upset or or not come back. But there's certainly ways uh, in terms of how you approach this that you can be respectful and really incorporate it um, into the uh, the workflow without alienating the patient and without um, you know having them leave or walk out and it'll just be a part of their overall care. Um, you know some of the uh, other uh, barriers are um, you know discomfort on the on the uh, side of the practitioner with uh, you know substance use with discussions about substance use or substance misuse. Um, these are the difficult issues to bring up and you certainly want to make sure that you have had enough training or technical assistance. Um, you know, webinars such as these, uh, other videos are out there. Um, there's lots of information about this in order to for you to get comfortable and familiarize yourself with issues around substance use. Um, you know, I, it, you know, for the screening and brief intervention, it doesn't have to be that labor intensive, but you do want to do some some background and due diligence to make sure that you're comfortable with. Um, you know, talking about these subjects. Um, the second one on the page is very similar: lack of education and training about the nature of substance use and/or dependence and treatment. So, as I say, you definitely want to make sure that you do your due diligence and you do engage in some uh, continuing education around these, you know, topics in order to bring them up, given the fact that they're critically important to providing for the overall health of the client uh, of the patient. Um, and also the last one, uncertainty about referral sources. This is a very common one that a lot of primary care um, um, practitioners bring up, which is, you know, if I screen for these things and they test positive, well, what do I do with them? Where, where do, you know, where can I have, find some, some assistance? Where can I, what are the resources in the community in which I can refer uh, patients who may be uh, chemically dependent or alcohol dependent to if they are, if they need something more than the screening or brief intervention? You know, the expert process offers an opportunity for primary care uh, practitioners who are willing to provide um, to engage with the larger community around them in order to facilitate you know those sorts of connections interactions um, you know that will help that process um, if you believe as I do that um, screening for this is critically important to the overall health of the of the patient um, you know these things can be done in terms of looking around in the community um, building partnerships with a uh, drug treatment agency that may be in the community and some of these partnerships are, are can can be over time can be relatively lucrative for both the primary care setting and the uh, substance abuse treatment setting in terms of referrals um, you know partnerships that can work for everybody involved so 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 it's definitely a lot of potential there to do that so um, just before I take some questions here, I want to talk about some of the resources here. Um, SAMHSA has an expert web page, um, the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration, um, you know, by the federal government, has been out in front on the issue of promoting expert across the country. And they have even gone to the point where they have uh, put out grants to states and to, um, um, to medical schools around uh, expert. So they have a number of resources related to ESPER and they have information related to all of their grantees who have put very robust ESPER trainings together, ESPER trainings and ESPER initiatives together across the country. Second uh, resource there is the Center for Integrated Health Solutions, which is where I work. We have developed an ESPER clearinghouse, which correlates a lot of the information out there related to ESPER. So we have different sections on the site related to financing of ESPER, related to screening, uh, related to uh, brief intervention, um, workflow. We have a number of the workflow diagrams that I talked about on that website. So if you go there, it's it's sort of a one-stop shop in terms of uh, information about ESPER. And at AAA, um, they have a number of different resources there, a number of publications, training manuals, uh, workflow charts around standard drinks, um, uh, clinicians guides uh, and support resources there. The uh, motivational interviewing website, which has a number of different tools that tell you much more than I did in this webinar around motivational interviewing. 
um, American College of Emergency Physicians. This is a training video which demonstrates a lot of the processes that I talked about earlier um, around SBIRT. Um, Boston University, um, they also have a uh, you know, SBIRT training curriculum and they have videos there. And also, um, the, um, there's also um, Drinking Reproductive Health. Um, this is a toolkit related to substance use and uh, alcohol use um, for pregnant women. So this is a resource that is there um, if you have um, a number of pregnant women who you may be concerned about. This is a resource for you. So um, now I will take a few questions. Um, let's see, I have one here. Um, okay, she wants to know how she can obtain a PowerPoint um, a copy of the PowerPoint for reference. Um, I believe that um, Morehouse is going to put the PowerPoint up on their website and there will be an audio attached to that. Um, so so that will be there for you if you want to access that. Um, if there are any other questions, um, I'll be happy to take those now. Also, too, to the participants, the resources will be listed on, on the Primary Care for All website. Um, Gail, you can um, just email me at sajackson at msm.edu so I can make sure. Because are you asking for a copy of the slides yourself? So sajackson at msm.edu. Thank you. Erin, I have a question. Um, when it comes to the screening, you were saying that we can actually bill for it. Um, yes. And that's with any of the, yes. the screens that you suggested? Yeah, the only um, criteria, that, the criteria that they have is that the, uh, <clears throat> uh, is that the screen be a, a reliable and valid screen. So um, that it, it is um, psychometrically valid and reliable. And those screens that I um, showed you uh, on the screening page are um, you know, valid and reliable screens, um, particularly the audit and the assist, which are the more um, commonly used screens there. So, 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 yeah, so for the screening and brief intervention, you can, um, primary care can bill for those services. Um, uh, Medicare does pay Medicaid. Um, you have to check with your states about, you know, whether or not those codes are turned on. But but um, there's some ability there as well. Any code link? And does that screening um, d does it have to be by us, the providers? Sometimes in our offices, we may have nurses or medical assistants that can help with some of those things. So do those screens have to be um, administered by the healthcare professional? Can they be a part of the, um, the, the paperwork that they use to check in? Can it be administered by an assistant? Is there any, um, any guidelines when it comes to coding for that? Well, um, the, the short answer is yes. Um, they, they can be done by some of those professionals, um, you know, nurses. Some, I don't, you know, it really depends on, you know, what your uh, primary care organization is doing, how their workflow is set up, how they triage patients as they come in. Um, you know, it really depends on sort of what works well for you. I, I know what a lot of folks do is they may have those shorter one to two question screens as a part of the uh, the history or the workup that folks may answer that in the beginning before they see anybody and if they screen positive on those then they'll get the longer assessment maybe by a nurse or nurse practitioner um, before they see the doctor and the doctor will come in and sort of um, you know, verify the results and you know say this person you know has you know is at risk for um, hazardous drinking use or something like that. 
so so yes so the answer is yes um you can use other professions doesn't have to necessarily be the doctor but you know it, it's a primary care setting so um so those folks would be available to do it and and the doctor verifying those results would work um looks like i have um one um <clears throat> question that came in and this is what kind of advice can you give to patients coming into dental clinics and are very persistent drug seekers um well this is a this is a bit of a different issue um around sort of uh um, pain management and uh you know drug seeking behavior in, in in primary care settings um you any dental facility um because you know this has come up before so any primary care setting um and other settings other than behavioral health settings would be good settings to potentially look at imp implementing some sort of expert practice so even in a dental setting you could look at adding questions to your initial workup or initial histories that are related to the level of substance use um, um, the per the, the clients are the, the patient is engaging in so you would have some mechanism to at least assess that and potentially uh, you know send that person to or refer that person to more uh, advanced forms of treatment if the conditions warrant so these expert practices would be something that you should consider um, if you're in a dental setting as well So yeah, it looks like I have have another one. Okay, um, let's see. Um, some clinics screen, screen all patients on depression with a quick screening prior to their exam appointment. Any thoughts on developing a screening evaluation that covers multiple issues, e.g., depression, alcohol use? What are your thoughts on this? Well, <clears throat> a couple of things. There are a number of different screens out there that do um, give provide a broader behavioral health screen for clients as they come in. Um, most of the research and the U.S. Preventative, Medi preventative uh, Task Force Preventative Medicine um, has issued um, directives around screening for alcohol. Now other primary care settings do more robust screenings than just alcohol but most of the recommendations about it center around alcohol. Um, and there's some separate screen, separate recommendations for depression and other sorts of things. But in terms of the behavioral health stuff, I mean, there's there is you know, substance use. There is alcohol um, screenings that are out there. So that's why a lot of the conversation you're going to see is about expert as it pertains to alcohol, because that's where the um, you know the uh, U.S. Preventative Medicine Task Force has recommended that get think giving it like a, a grade of a B and that's what a lot of the states reimburse for. Um now there are some states out there, I think Wisconsin is one where they do provide a, a much broader behavioral health screen. They screen for not only depression but anxiety, alcohol, um, and I believe in some instances they screen for domestic violence. Uh, so, I mean, those are out there, and it's something, um, depending on what's going on in your health center, you may want to take a look at. So. Well, thank you, Aaron. I'm not sure if we have any more questions coming in. There's a little bit of a lag, um, mm -hmm. as in the since the participants have to type it in. So, right. um, thanks for your patience. While we are waiting to see if there are any um, any final questions to come through, I would like to um, announce that this recording, th this webinar tonight, was recorded, and it will be available on primarycareforall.org um, in the on-demand section. Um, Mr. Williams, do you have, if the participants would like to have copies of your slides, is that something that they can receive like in a PDF or um, do you have a preference with that or?
Should we just um should they just email me offline if they'd like to get a copy of them? Yeah, I mean they can just email you offline or um I just put up my uh contact information so they can uh email me there or they can uh you know call me if they like the uh to 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 get the slides or a copy of the slides I have, you know, copies here. Um, so, so either way is fine. Um, so this is my contact information. If folks need anything else related to Espert, or if they need anything else um, related to what the Center for Integrated Health Solutions has to offer. Um, oh, that's awesome! Thank you so much, and thank you also for an insightful and engaging presentation tonight. Um, we appreciate your expertise. Um, it was it was very very enlightening for me. So good tools to put into practice. I would okay. be remiss tonight if I didn't give a special thanks to our um, IT person, Qualin. Thank you for providing your expertise as well. And also to our audience for your questions and comments. It really helps to fuel the presentation. Again, this series is made possible through a partnership. This partnership allows us here at PrimaryCareForAll.org to serve as a resource for the National Health Service Corps members. Direct financial support for this webinar series is made possible through a cooperative agreement with the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services, HRSA, and the Bureau of Clinician Recruitment and Services. As I mentioned earlier, this webinar was recorded and it will be available in the on-demand section. In addition, if you go to our website in the share section under general behavior health and primary care, there are PDFs listed of the screening tools for you to print off and be able to use in your clinic. And then under the links section, there are links to the resource um, organizations that Mr. Williams referenced in his presentation. Um, finally, I want to remind you to check out our blog section, our um, forum section, as well as check the calendar for next month's webinar that begins on the second Wednesday of the month. An evaluation for this presentation will pop up in another window if you're using IE or another tab if you're using Firefox. Please complete it in its entirety in order to receive your one hour CE credit. Again, thank you, Mr. Williams, for an insightful presentation. And to our audience, have a wonderful evening. Thank all right, you. Thank you, and thank you all. All right.